I'm Kevin Suarez, and on behalf of my fellow Academy Director, Kara Hansen, thank you for attending. Today, we'd like to welcome Larissa Silvia, a Certified Strength and Conditioning Coach, and formerly with the University of Rhode Island Athletic Strength and Conditioning Program. For those with questions for Larissa, we will be posting a link to a Google form in the chat window. Please enter your questions there, and we will call on you to ask your questions as time allows. There will be a quote-unquote motivational session where you will need your red and yellow cards. Please make space around you, dress in comfortable clothing, and have your camera on pointing in your direction. Webinar points are on the line, so get ready. We'd like to thank our Webinar Wednesday series sponsor, usofficials.com, for their commitment to referees. US Officials has become one of the largest assigning platforms under a single team in the country and has signaled its intention to give back to the referees it works with. I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Levon Akaglanian from US Officials to say a few words. Levon? Um, well, thank you very much for, for everyone attending this seminar. On behalf of Paul Atanasiades, we welcome you all to the new edition of US Official Ac Academy webinar sessions. Um, we have several of this uh, on schedule, and hopefully you will enjoy each and every one of them. Uh, I look forward listening to Larissa Sylvia, um, presenting her, giving you guys vast knowledge of her past experience, and providing you guidance going to the future of becoming a referee. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn over directly to Kevin and Kara um, to go forward with the seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Levon. Tomorrow on the New England Premiership Thursday seminar series, we will have Alan Kelly, former FIFA and current MLS slash pro referee. Alan will talk about game management as this topic. Please join us. Next Wednesday, we're pleased to announce Eric Simmons, former MLS referee and pro regional uh, referee. Uh, development assistant and national referee coach. Eric will be discussing the path to pro and will be answering your questions on that. So please come prepared. Without further ado, I'd like to present our feature speaker for tonight, Ms. Larissa Silvia. Hi everyone. Uh, good to see you all and be here tonight. And thank you very much, Kevin and Kara, for having me here. Um, I'm going to pop up my stuff on the screen right now so we can do some introductions and then get up um, into the presentation. So let me get it up here for you all. All right. All right, so tonight our topic is gonna be training for performance. First, a little background about myself, okay. Um, as you can see, first and foremost, this is my family over there on my right, maybe your left, you're looking at it. And, um, this in first and foremost is uh, probably my best accomplishment. These two children in front of you, crazy, uh, crazy kids, but the best uh, accomplishment thus far of any of these things. Um, just a little bit about uh, where I started and how I got into uh, strength training, into performance training. Um, it started at a young age. Um, I was a soccer player. Uh, as you can see up there, I was a collegiate soccer player. Um, I played in high school, did all of the, you know, um, different um, lady rays, all of that stuff growing up. And uh, I just loved the game of soccer. I still do. It's still immersed in my life. And I also love exercise and I love training. Um, my mom used to think I was really sick for coming home from a, you know, um, any kind of practice or whatever. And I'd be super sore and climbing up the stairs and she would she would think I was insane for loving that feeling but really that's kind of where it all all started and um, as I was trying to decide what to do with my life after you know high school soccer and then um, in college I decided to pursue athletic training or sports medicine so I do have a bachelor's of science in, in sports medicine which um, has really helped my career and um, training at, at this level and performance training. Um, one, because you need a vast an amount of knowledge in um, injury prevention, and it's just helped me to um, better train the athletes and the people that I work with, knowing how the body works and where, and where it goes. So um, after I pursued that 
um, athletic training, I, I kind of realized that that's not exactly what I wanted to do. I loved the education. I thought it was, I thought it was great. It was wonderful. It was a good tool in the toolbox. Um, however, I really didn't want to tape ankles for the rest of my life. <laughs> and while athletic trainers definitely play a very important role and they're amazing and help, have helped me and my athletes. So um, and I work very closely with them. Um, I just really loved the training part piece of it all. I, I loved being in the prevention of all of that versus the, um, you know, on the front lines, if you will. So um, I then pursued a graduate work at um, Springfield College in Massachusetts. They have a really awesome exercise science program and I graduated there with a, um, uh, exercise science and sports studies. Um, after that, I got really lucky and I had done several internships um, and I live in Rhode Island. This is my home state. This doesn't happen very often, but I got really lucky and uh, got a job at the University of Rhode Island in my home, in my home state, um, coaching uh, all different sports there, six different, I think at one time, and including the men's and women's soccer team. That was the joy of my life. It was it was a lot of fun working with athletes, and um, I hope that you guys understand that you fall under that category of ath 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 an athlete. Um, as I listened to last Wednesday, I was on on the webinar um, listening to Catherine Nesbitt, and as I listened to her speak, I just realized more, even more, that you guys really are athletes, and you should think of yourselves that way. Um, it is, it, I actually, I knew you put in the work, but I really didn't know how much until I listened to her talk about the road it took to her to get to the professional level and, and the World Cup, which I'm sure some of you are, are striving for. So with that said, we're going to get into our challenge or our icebreaker here. I have a nice little video because I know some of you, there are two people in this world. There are some of you who are like, let's go get on the train. And then there are some of you who are like my son here. I don't know if you guys, I'm sure being on social media, you've probably seen um, all these challenges that are going around. Uh, one of them was the push-up challenge. And... <laughs> My son was challenged, my four-year-old son was challenged by one of my former interns. And this is probably some of your sentiment right now when it comes to this challenge. And I'll just uh, show you this little video of him doing his push-up challenge. All right, can you do 10? 10? Yeah, can you do 10? <laughs> He looked at me like, are you crazy? 10, 10 push-ups. His form's a bit off too, but this might be some of you. <laughs> um, right now, so the challenge is gonna be, um, and Kara's gonna help me out with this one. Um, just keeping an eye on all of you guys, but um, if you could find a wall in your house, wherever you are, that you can post up, we're gonna do a wall sit, and you should also have your red and yellow cards with you, okay? So just a little instruction here on what a good wall sit is. A good wall sit is 90 degrees, okay? Your, your thighs should be parallel to the ground. You're not allowed to touch your thighs and you are not allowed to post your hands up on the wall and use it for, um, for help, that's cheating. So good form would be hands right by your side. You're gonna have red card in one hand, yellow card in the other. When I say begin, you're gonna fall down into your excellent, excellent, form of your wall sit and I'm going to call out I'm going to be a referee today guys this is I'm getting the I'm getting the inside scoop on red and yellow card offenses here so I'm going to call out um one either a red or a yellow card at fence and what you're going to do is with these red cards by your side whatever one I call out you have to put up which card it is as you're holding it you hold the card up until the next one comes, okay? And if it's still a yellow one, you still hold the one hand up, or if it's still the red one, if not, you switch, okay? So 
Let's get started with this one. So everybody should be down, find yourself a wall, get some space, okay? Maybe I can get a, a thumbs up or a, Kara, maybe you can keep an eye and see if everybody is completely ready for this. <laughs> and then when we're ready to go, I'm gonna start calling out the offenses here. And then we can, um, as at, you guys will be getting points for this. So it's gonna, it's gonna at least last a minute. So if you can hold on for a minute or so, you're gonna get 10 points if you're still standing during this. It could be more than a minute. Bonus points for the person who has the highest score. So keep track. All right. All right, I'm gonna get my little timer out here. And then I'm gonna start it out. Kara, you can let me know if, if uh, we got like a thumbs up from most of the group here. Can we, can we get a, yeah, we got thumbs up. Okay. I see you, Risto. <laughs> yes, I love it. All right. Okay, so this is great for two reasons. One, you're getting a good workout today, <laughs> or at least a good exercise part of it. Some of you may have worked out today. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> also, <laughs> also um, in any situation, be it training or on the field as you're refing, okay, there's gonna be situations where there's brain fog or there's a little bit of challenge there and you gotta think quickly. And as the pain ensues, you still have to make a good decision, okay? So you gotta listen through the pain and figure out which is red or yellow. Okay. Are we ready, Kara? We are ready. Stop All right. eating dinner. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So everybody, in position, you're going to have your hands by your side. You're going to red card, yellow card, doesn't really matter which hand is in. And I'm going to start calling out an offense. This is fun. I get the inside knowledge. All right, here we go. Does not retire at least 10 yards away from an opponent's corner kick. All right. Woohoo. All right. Got yellow cards. Good job, Good. guys. The kicker, when both the kicker and the goalkeeper commit an offense at the same time and the kick is scored, goal is disallowed. Yellow card, okay? Great. Good. Yes. Using offensive, insulting, or abusive language and or gestures. Harris, that went up quick. <laughs> Some of you probably experienced that way too much. I think we're all missing it a little bit right now. <laughs> Delays leaving the field of play when being substituted. Yellow cards all around. Good, Good job guys. Changes places jerseys with the goalkeeper during play or without the referee's permission. Caution both players at the next stoppage. Maybe you didn't know, need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm practicing my ref skills. Yep. You guys got a freebie. <laughs> freebie. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> All right, here we go. Instructed to leave the field to correct equipment. And yellow cards, and Caleb fell. <laughs> All right, one's out. He doesn't get points. <laughs> <laughs> There's the yellow card. Perfect. All right, makes authorized marks, unauthorized marks on the field. I'm making it go for a little more than a minute here, so hold strong, guys. Good job, guys. Yellow cards all around, good. Yellow cards, great. This one makes me laugh. Spitting or biting an opponent at, or any other person. The fact that that actually has to be written down. Yep. <laughs> we, laugh our, we laugh at that one too, but it's yeah. definitely a red card. Good job, guys. All right, and last one, here we go. Leaving the field while a defender to place an opponent in the apparent offside position. Did I say that right? I don't know. Close enough. Everybody got their red yellow cards up anyway. Perfect. <laughs> All 
All right, you guys, you can hopefully you broke a little sweat, perhaps, maybe, maybe not, but your legs should have been shaking a little bit at least. <laughs> Good job, guys. All right, now I have your secrets. <laughs> we also have a score sheet, so if you guys remember, remember your score, uh, Kevin's going to put the link in the chat, and you can enter your score for some extra bonus points in our, uh, our little competition. Yes, do so. All right, good job, guys. That's only a little taste if you get to hang out with me of what it'll be like. And uh, we're using the uh, same score, sh uh, same sheet as the uh, questions. So go ahead and enter them in there. No, it's a different sheet. I sent oh, you a different, different sheet. sheet. Yeah. Okay, then I'll put the different sheet up. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is kind of start off with um, some information, what I do, uh, what is, training and performance. And then I'm gonna give you some, some tools, strength training wise, conditioning wise, agility, everything that um, it, it encompasses um, athletic performance or, or maintaining or getting to that optimal athletic performance. Um, there could be an hour discussion about each one of these points. So I'm trying to put it all in kind of uh, together for you guys, things that will um, help you as referees and kind of give you um, a little education on it and also to empower you guys to do it and um, come up with some things on your own to be able to do. Um, at the end of this, we'll also talk about some things that you can do in quarantine. Um, while you're in quarantine um, and some other extenuating circumstances that you might in, be in and then also go over how you can periodize and how training fits into all your seasons. So <clears throat> first up, the performance coach. So what do I do for you as a referee or any athlete up there? You can see that's my men's soccer team at URI, really fun to work with. Um, many of you have probably met um, some, their head coach. Um, but my, my main concern for training anybody is to reduce the risk of injury and, and or sickness, okay? Um, that is our main priority because you guys need to do a job just as athletes need to do a job. And you can't do that if you're injured and, you're, and you cannot do that if you're sick. So it's all about keeping you on the field and keeping you healthy and keeping your mind healthy and all these other things so that you can perform at your best, okay? So I'm gonna, I also monitor and provide um, correct training loads, okay? So it's not just a shot, shot in the dark. Um, there's a lot of periodization and there's a lot of um, talking to the athletes or you as the referees to figure out what it is exactly that you guys need um, on an individual basis um, to get to where you need to be, okay? So that's my job, maximize your fitness, motivate you, and then educate you and empower you to do these things, not um, when you're not with me or somebody who is training training you, but give you the tools to be able to um, do these things on your own. So what is training athletic performance? Really, it's a progression and a pursuit of excellence in the context of sport or the demands of life. It could be the demands of life or and or your job, which yours kind of but you guys kind of fall under both. It's, it's, uh, it's your life. It's your job. You guys are athletes. It's kind of a sport for you. How we do these things, uh, we do them through strength training, conditioning, agility, flexibility, nutrition, and also um, this is a huge one. It's the emotional and the psychological piece of it, the mentality. Okay, this is it. Everything actually starts there. It starts in your mind and it starts. Um, with what you're telling yourself and it in it and your thoughts can permeate and and also affect these things so i'm going to talk a lot about that also because i think it's a piece that's missed a lot in training and then also uh recovery of course which is a very very important piece so why is your fitness important well quite honestly your job depends on it <laughs> if you um, if you are not fit enough, and as I said, when I was sitting in there talking, um, listening to Catherine Nesbitt speak, um, I really, this really just 
made it more evident for me that your job really depends on it. Um, especially if you're looking to go to the next level, you have to uh, be up to par where it comes to fitness. Um, so that's, that's the main reason. And then other reasons are health and, and, and injury prevention. Okay. Like I mentioned previously, you cannot be on the field and be the best you, the best referee in a match. If you are injured or you're not healthy. So it's super important to be able to function and it's what you have control over. So there are some things that are uncontrollable, right, in our lives, but what you have control over is what uh, you can do. That means when you get up, when you train, what you put in your body, and it's really should empower you to know that you have control over um, the outcome of this. You just have to dedicate yourself to it. <clears throat> and that in, in turn can separate you from the pack, okay? Um, when you're trying to get to the next level, I mean, when Catherine was talking about her, um, they started off with 300 people and then they were down to, I don't even know how many, but they start weeding people out and part of it comes down to, I mean, there are many things involved, obviously with um, referee, refereeing and, but one of them is fitness. And if you can't keep up and you can't make it, then you're gonna be weeded out. So you best start working on that now. Okay, so how do we achieve optimal performance? Um, part-time training gets part-time results, okay? So it should be something that's on your mind all the time, okay? You can't half dedicate yourself to anything, really. You can't dedicate half or train part-time and this week I'm gonna go running, next week I'm not, you know, train for a month or so and kind of fall off the wagon and expect that you're going to show up to the game and be in your best, your best shape and be the best ref that you can be. Okay. <clears throat> so before we go any further, I am, I want to uh, have you guys stop for a sec and uh, think about and write down what are some of your training goals. And I don't want them to be broad goals because broad goals kind of get lost. You need to be very specific about what you want when out of your training. So broad goals would be like improving my performance. I, I don't want to get injured. I, to be a better ref, to eat healthy, to develop speed, strength, flexibility. I want them to be more specific. And what I mean by that is some of these as an example. Um, you want to, as a female, do you want to pass the men's fitness test? Everybody say yes to that. <laughs> um, name the score. Name what you want to get. Um, here's another one. Strength tank strength train three times a week, be able to lift X weight, cut out excess sugar that, that be related to nutrition and be able to keep up with the play. So I want everybody to write um, down about five specific goals as it relates to performance training as a referee. And then um, Kara is gonna call some of you out because we would love to hear what you have to say. Um, one thing about writing goals is it's not something that you want to keep to yourself because um, keeping it to yourself allows you to kind of slack off and or um, not stick to your goals. So finding somebody, an accountability partner, or verbalizing what your specific goals are are going to be um, help to keep you on task and help you to reach your goals better. So um, I want you all to take a moment to write those down and then Kara is going to jump in and she is going to call out some people, put them on the hot seat because I want to hear what you guys um, have for some of your goals. <clears throat> And that will kind of also help prompt some questions, hopefully, from you guys um, as far as later on on how to achieve some of those goals that you're getting. And we'll answer some of those questions probably as we go through here. But if there's anything extra or anything that you think of related to these goals, you can ask them later for questions. So I'll, we'll give you a minute or so to write those down. And then, and then Kara is going to call some of you out. <clears throat>
This is my favorite part. Hearing what, uh, hearing what, where you guys want to be, um, for any athlete really, cause that's my job. I want to help you get there. So I would love to hear what some of you have to say. All right, we'll give you another couple seconds and then we'll start start calling on some people. Similar to how we did it last week, we'll we'll unmute you and you can go ahead and talk. All right. Here we go. We're going to start with Gabby. Can you guys hear me? We can. Yep. Okay. Um, one of my goals was to focus um, twice a week on an active recovery day, whether that be um, like stretching or um, like going on a walk. So something to kind of um, help my body recover after hard workout days. It's a good one. And often not uh, really put to the forefront or taken very seriously. <laughs> so good, good, good one. Adam, you're next. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. All right. Um, especially uh, when I went into this winter and do now to quarantine, I've gained a lot of uh, unnecessary weight. So I want to drop uh, 10 pounds at least going into, um, let's say, the fall, uh, just to give myself a little more of a time frame. But uh, to put a numeric to it, I want to drop 10 pounds by then. Good, I like it. Specific. Got to get specific with your goals. That's good. All right, Caleb. So I've actually got mine written down for the year. Wow, look at and you. I love it. My end of the year goal is 160 pounds at an 8% body fat. Um, my current BMI is about 24.6. So that's where I want to go. And then I can't do a pull-up to save my life, so uh, my goal at the end of the year is 20 pull-ups in a row. Good. Good for you. That's great. It's really about setting intentions, guys. These are, um, I love that, that you just wrote out your entire years. That's great. It's, um, it really helps to map out and, and um, just challenge yourself, and then it, and it also it helps so you're not getting lost and then you forget about where you're going basically. So I love that. Anybody else? I love these. All right, Nicole Steiner, you want to go next? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. All right. So I'm working on passing the men's fitness test Good for you. Uh, here in Idaho, we kind of, we kind of talk about different men's fitness tests, whether it be like the 1720 or but I really want to pass the 1518, which is a stretch for me. Mm -hmm. I feel confident with the 1720. So I'm really working on my sprint training right now, trying to get that passed. Awesome. I love it. Thank you. All right. Couple, you want to do a couple more, Larissa? Sure, I would love to. Maybe, maybe two more, and then we can move on. Perfect. All right, how about Sarah Griggs? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, my goal for um, the next month is to get my mile down to a six-minute mile from um, a 6.36 at the moment. So Perfect. That's my goal. Good. That's good. Awesome. All right. 
And last but not least, let's have Tyler. Hello. Um, so two, two goals that I have. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. Um, two goals is to run consecutive five-and-a-half-minute miles, three consecutive. Mm -hmm. And then train, strength training four times a week. Good. I like that. I like it. That was the last one, or we have one more? Uh, we can do one more if you want. Um, I thought I wasn't keeping count, <laughs> <laughs> which my athletes would always yell at me for because I have a tendency not to keep count, and then we start all over. <laughs> all right. How about Harris? Here. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, Harris. Awesome. Um, so the two goals I have for this year is um, passing the, the men's fitness test at the, the next level for me. Yep. Um, and then uh, the second one is planning my nutrition better on uh, match days. Um, sometimes it's challenging with uh, what flows from like regular life going into uh, game day. And then if it's especially if it's an early kickoff, sometimes the morning's a bit of like a rush. And then yep. when I reflect at the end of the day, there's not much of a uh, um, you know, I think like, oh, I probably should have planned that better. And it's something you really need to plan over 24 hours in advance rather than, okay, what's for breakfast today? Yes. Good. Love it. All right. Those are all really, really good. I like, I like that. Um, I just would inc keep encouraging you guys to set goals and check them off when you make them and make new ones when you're done setting and achieving all the goals that you have set. Okay. Um, you have to get in the right, the right mind frame and you got to know, uh, where you're going. You have to know where you've been and know where you're going to get where you're going. So um, I am a big, a big fan of setting goals and for keeping you accountable for what it is that you need to get done. So uh, speaking of setting goals, we're going to move on. We're going to move on here to, um, let's see, the mental game. Okay. So part of optimal achieving optimal performance starts um with the mental game okay so this this book the mind gym i don't know if any of you have ever read it um is actually a very good book good short read um and it just talks about um achieving the inner ex excellence um how to set your mind mind frame good stories from across all different kind of um athletics um on um how people have achieved um, through their mental game, okay? And really, there is a mind-body connection and it's very real. Your state of mind directly will impact your physical body. So if you have, uh, if you're putting garbage in, you're gonna get garbage out. If um, you are stressed, if you are um, negative self-talking, if you are um, like down on yourself all the time about, you know, the calls you made in the game, anything. This all can affect your, your mental, um, your mental whereabouts will affect your physical body. And it's not just, oh yeah, it'll affect your physical body. It scientifically changes the makeup of your body, um, hormone wise. Um, and when it comes to recovery, it can uh, wreak havoc on it, okay? So the first part of it is um, getting your mental game right and setting uh, the tone in your mind first before you move forward with any kind of physical training. Um, it's very, very important, and I can't stress this enough because I've seen so many athletes and um, people who are have so much potential um, really just l lose it here in the mental game and have never actually achieved um, where, where I think that they really could be. Um, and they haven't lived up to what their potential is because um, they have got it in their, their, in their own head, okay? So it's important and how we do this is, is what we just did. Um, we start with goal setting and you positive self-talk. You talk about yourself making, um, doing those things. Don't ever say, I can't do it. You're gonna say, I will do those pull-ups. I will pass the, women, uh, the men's fitness test, okay? You gotta start telling yourself that you can do these things before you do anything, okay? <clears throat> so 
getting somewhere physically first requires you to be there mentally. That's basically what I'm trying to say. <laughs> All right, so with that said, we're going to move on. Let's see here. Let me get this next slide up for you um, with nutrition. So uh, this is just one short little slide because I believe you guys are having someone come in and, and go in depth on nutrition. But um, I, I do have training in nutrition and it is something that um, goes hand in hand with my job, just like the mental piece of it. Okay. <clears throat> so Often what people don't realize is that nutrition is the limiting factor in a training program. So if you're not fueling your body, you could get all the sleep that you got. You could, you know, train as hard as you could. And it's really not going to matter because if you're not fueling your body properly, you're not going to be able to recover. You're not um, going to restore your body when you're asleep. So you need to optimize your nutrition in order to optimize your re results that you're trying to get and then also optimize your performance. I can't stress this enough. Um, you know, and it looks different for everybody because, um, you know, we're not all the same. And we shouldn't all eat the same things and our bodies um, also respond differently. Um, so this is really an individual thing. There are some broad things that um, cover everyone, like these few that I have um, down on the slide. Clean just means um, not eating processed foods and highly sugared things. Basically, if it comes from the ground, you wanna eat it. And fruits, vegetables, uh, meats, um, and eat often, this one only applies to when you are training. When I mean, when I don't eat often, if you're sitting at home in quarantine and not training. <laughs> All right, so you want to be able to fuel your body for what it is that you're doing. If you're sitting on the couch watching Netflix, you shouldn't be eating that often because then you're just gonna gain 10 pounds. So hydrate, a uh, huge one, it's the silver bullet, okay? So we have um, nutrition that we're putting in our body, but uh, you know our cells are all made up of water and they function in that environment. And if we're, you're dehydrated, None of that matters, okay? And then uh, nutrition, huge for recovery. Like I said, if you're not getting the nutrients in, then you're not um, going to be able to optimize your performance. There's a lot more that could be said about this and you might have a lot more questions and you can um, ask them at the end if you want a little more specific ones, but also I, you guys have a nutritionist coming, which is really, really great. <clears throat> Let's see. All right, so then we're gonna get into the strength training piece of it. Um, this is something that I think, especially if you've been a soccer player, um, which a lot of referees um, probably have been at some point in their life, and they have this mentality of, because we're running on the soccer field, that our training should be running. Some, um, some other, uh, like overseas, a lot of, and it's, it's changing, it's changing now, but America, uh, the Americans are very into their strength training um, and some other countries, not so much, uh, a lot of uh, running and maybe body weight stuff, um, but it is such an important piece. And I feel like um, you have those coaches that are just run, 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 or, you know, because we're running, we're gonna run, but really the foundation of everything is your strength training. Um, why it is, is because it builds strong muscles around your joints. That's really important for injury prevention. If you don't have strong muscles around your joints, you're not going to last very long, okay? You're gonna be injured and that's not the point. We want you on the field. We don't want you on the sideline. It's to uh, balance out your musculature. So um, all of us innately have you know, one side that's stronger than the other. And if you played any sport in your life, uh, baseball, soccer, those sports come with um, imbalances just because of the nature of the sport. So all of us have muscular imbalances and we need to do our best to um, right those so that we don't get injured. So that goes back to injury prevention. Um, it's for building potential speed and power. <clears throat> I say potential because there is a genetic variant in this. However, you can improve in speed and power um, 
and you can build the potential to do it, but you have to strength train and you need to work hard to do it. Some um, people might not realize this, um, but it strengthens your immune system as with any um, training, okay? So it, I talked about some of the hormonal impact that um, like mentality has, but training also has a hormonal impact on your body and, um, and it directly affects your immune system. So strength training not only helps you in your performance, but it's gonna help you to stay well so that you can be there. And when you get into these crazy seasons, like your fall, when you're, you have a thousand games going on at one time, that you're not gonna um, get beat down, hopefully, because your immune system is gonna be functioning properly. Um, like I said, it promotes uh, the positive hormonal balance. And that is uh, not only for, like I said, muscular, but in your mentality, in your, your brain, your mindset. Okay. <clears throat> so moving on here. What is a good strength training program? There are a lot of good ones out there. And there is, uh, I'm sure you guys have scoured the internet for training at some point and there's a thousand and one different things out there and not not all of it's great and there's a lot that's really good um but here's a, the things that that i think are um the basis for what good strength training would be okay and and first it's consistency you have to be consistent with training strength training for it to be to be good okay like i like I had mentioned before, you don't want to be, um, you know, train this week, don't train, train that week, don't train, train for two months, stop, get lazy. It has to be consistent. So if you, um, it doesn't have to be really hard all the time, but it needs to be consistent um, to see some changes. And the consistency will help to build habit as well. And then it will just be something you do without thinking about um, it's multilateral and it's ground based. So why I say this is because, you know, I'm sure you've seen videos of people standing on BOSU balls doing squats, which great for balance in certain things, but you guys are running and you're sprinting and your feet are on the ground and where you're going to build uh, the most potential for speed and power and strength is on the ground, ground-based training, okay? Can be single leg, can be double leg, um, but I wouldn't suggest squatting on a BOSU ball with weight on your back if you're trying to um, gain strength and especially power and speed because power and speed have to do with the amount of power that's going into a solid ground, okay? Um, it's progressive in nature. So progressive overload is basically what it means is you want to um, increase the loads progressively, be that uh, increasing the weight or the reps, but it could be in a week span, it could be in four weeks span, it could be in a year's training span, okay? But it has to be progressive and it can't be, um, and some of you might relate to this, you know, you're like, oh man, I need to get training and I haven't gotten in the gym. So uh, you go in and you hit it really hard. You grab the heaviest weights, probably the poorest form because you haven't done it in a while. And then you're beat down for an entire week um, because you did not correctly uh, periodize or progress yourself through exercise. So it's okay to start from basic, even if you are a little more experienced, okay? Um, I threw this one in there, uh, core focused. Um, and by core, I don't mean abs. I don't mean doing crunches. I don't mean getting a six pack and having a winter bod, uh, not a winter bod, a summer bod. That's not what I mean by uh, core focused. The core is from your shoulders, if you think of it as an X, from your shoulders to your hips in your front and your back, okay? So that involves um, your glutes, your abs, your back muscles, some, some of the uh, stabilizers in your shoulders and your back, okay? So you have to think of the center of your body as a pillar and it's it's the pillar in which everything else moves and if that's not strong and it breaks down then inevitably you're going to end up having injury because you're basically on a floppy noodle 
you want to be a nice strong pillar so it's core focused um, it and it emphasizes first um, technique uh, and this means you might have to scale it back and and start from the basic and just make sure that you're getting the form right and um, form over anything is is what I would suggest. Um, I wouldn't, you know, just pick up the heaviest weight and try to do it and do it poorly because this is this is what leads to injury, and it and it's not really helping you. So concentrating on technique first and then progressing as your technique gets better and then you load. Okay, um, it considers individual needs so everyone here has individual needs based on whatever your goals are and also based on just you um you know what kind of injuries do you have what um you know what imbalances do you have so you have to look at what your needs are um and figure out what works best for you or what you need to do to get yourself where you need to be and and then at the end of the day in a good training program is going to get results and if you don't get results what is the point <laughs> all right so where to start it starts with the needs analysis so you need to think about where what do i need are you somebody who needs to work on speed are you can't do pull-ups so my upper body strength is lacking um, my lower body strength is lacking i have uh i always get this one nagging injury what is it okay so you got to start with what it is that you need learn your proper technique you're going to start with low loads before you go high loads and you know this for me seems like common sense but i'm going to say it because some people you know they just don't know maybe you you don't train um, and also low intensity before high intensity. So I'm going to start here. I'm going to show you just a little um, video of each one of these circuits. I'm going to start with a body weight one. And I, I have it in this um, order because this is kind of what the progression would be. If you're starting out, um, just I have you haven't trained or you haven't trained in a while or you're coming off of a off season and you're just getting back into training you don't want to start where the end the end goal is okay so you still I would suggest always kind of coming back around full circle and starting with foundational stuff movement patterns learning new techniques um, and proper techniques and and you would just basically cycle this through the year. So I'm going to show you a video. I made these for the URI women's soccer team, but it applies uh, for everyone. And um, it doesn't have any sound, so I'll be kind of talking over it, though, um, to kind of tell you or show you what this is. So here's just an example of a body weight circuit that you could do. You might see some bands in here. Um, I can kind of consider those some body weight in, in certain scenarios here. So here is the video, the first body weight circuit. <clears throat> you can kind of ignore this part. <laughs> All right, so I start off with, um, this is a plyometric and it's a depth drop. This is the first thing you want to work on um, when it comes to plyometrics. Um, it's landing mechanics first before you get into um, hardcore plyos like jumping um, hurdles or box jumps. You want to always land, learn to land properly um, for injury purposes. Here is a, uh, a banded body weight squat. So this is a great way, the band around your knee, to make sure that your knees and your legs are in line properly and that you're um, spreading the floor with your feet and you're feeling it all the right places. This is an inverted row. Also can be done with a TRX, which I don't know if you all have seen those, but they're the straps. This is just a, a circuit. So this is something you could put together body weight. <clears throat> you could do this in your home if you have um, any of these bands. If you noticed um, multi-directional, okay, so now we're hitting some lateral movements. <clears throat> I should have put some music over this. It would have been way more entertaining. <laughs> So some lateral lunges, 
with a slide board, some hip ridges, great for the glutes core. And um, the band, again, around the knees are for proper form and to activate your, your glutes. So this is a very basic body weight circuit. There could be a thousand different ones that you could come up with. I'm just kind of giving you an example. Here's a side plank. It's a modified one. So if you have trouble doing regular planks and some band walks, great for hip strength. And then this is uh, for the hamstrings in RDL. Great for working on form for that hip hinge. Gets the glutes and the hamstrings really well. So if you noticed, it's um, a full body, total body. I'm a big proponent of doing total body workouts. Um, you can switch it so you do an upper body, lower body day, but um, when you have a job and you have other things going on, the best way to kind of get everything in is to do a total body workout and to um, the way you basically not do the same thing is, you know, one day you might do a squat and the next day you might do something for the hamstrings so that you're getting total body in, but you're, you're, the days that you're doing will be for, um, a pull like for your hamstrings and another day might be for more of your quads. And then one day would be a back and one would be for your arms. So how do you progress body weight exercises? Um, what you wanna do is change your tempo. So this would be something good that you could do at home too and I'm probably gonna discuss this later too. But if you only have access to body weight, uh, stuff or you're starting out with the foundational things that we're talking about um, this is how you would progress it you would change the tempo so you might come down for three seconds hold the squat at the bottom for two seconds and then come up uh, really quick you can change the tempo you can play with the tempo um, the basically the idea of this is to um, create as much time under tension it's called in your muscle to um, tax it because after if you've all done some uh, body weight before, you know that it only goes so far um, and then you need to load it. But this is a way that you can get the most out of a body weight exercise. Um, and that's change the tempo. Um, you would in increase the reps that you're doing or you increase the sets that you're doing or add a band to it. Um, and the other one is you just go to failure because you can't make progress in um, your strength gains if you're, you're not taxing the, nuff, the muscles enough. So at some point in time, this is a good way, way to, um, a good foundational piece where to start is body weight. And then at, at a certain point in time when it becomes too easy and your form is looking really good, then you're gonna need to step it up. And then what you would want to do next then is, move on to dumbbells, putting some dumbbells into it. This is a dumbbell circuit that I came up with just as an example, so you can see what a dumbbell circuit might look like. So we're starting off with our body weight, which is foundational. You're working on your form and you're making sure that your body has a good sound um, foundation to work off of. And then we're gonna move up to some dumbbell circuits. So here we go. Dumbbell circuit. So I added a pre-workout warm-up to this and I kept it in because this will apply later on when we talk about some uh, mobility and flexibility and um, also recovery. So this is what I would this is a squat to stretch. This is something that I it would include in a mobility workout or um, for recovery as well, or dynamic warm up. This PVC overhead squat, really great. Also, you can do for body weight if um, instead of the band around the knees, but great to warm up, get opens up your hips, great for mob mobility in your shoulders. Yoga flow, I am by no means a yogi, so my knees were not completely straight there, so no judgment. <laughs> This um, opens up the hips, the back, everything just 
preparing us for the circuit. This is a little uh, balance included in the warm up. Some T spine rotation. This is to open up that back area. This one feels really good. If you need a break, you can get on the ground and do that one now. <laughs> and again, the RDL reach, um, use it in the body weight, but you can also use it as a warm up. Um, you can use it warm up pre lifting, you can use it warm up pre uh, game. Um, it is slowing down here, so I don't know why it's not going. Let me see. All right, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it stopped. <laughs> anyway, so um, I don't remember exactly what was on this one, but um, I can just verbalize here what it is for you guys. Um, basically, what you can do is just dumbbell anything, dumbbell squat. You can do uh, dumbbell presses, and you can circuit them up. Okay, you can you can put through two or three exercises together. You can string you know eight to ten exercises together in dumbbell and um, go through it and do it three to four times and as many uh, reps as we'll get into later. About um, depending on what um, training your phase you're in. So how do we progress this one more? Um, you add more reps with the same weight. You increase the weight each week and you change the angle of the movement. That might mean um, if you're doing a press, you're going to go from straight, um, maybe up to an incline. Um, you add movement or, or you superset the movements. Okay. Let's see. I'm having a little technical difficulty here. My computer is like freezing up after this video. Hold on. <clears throat> Let's see here. Let's see if I can get out of this, guys. Sorry. Okay. All right. I, I'm going to try to figure out what's going on with this. Maybe Kara or um, Kevin can it, do some questions while I try to figure out what's going on. <laughs> sure, not a problem. Um, Kara, do you have any of the questions set yet? Hold on one second, Kara. Okay, go ahead, Tara. Um, well, if Loris is trying to fix her computer, now might not be the best time for to ask her questions. But um, do, you, do Tom, do you want to talk about some of these exercises and how you found that they've helped you and alternatives and stuff like that? Sure. Um, I, I think Loris has given she's given us a lot of good exercises and it's been interesting for me. You know, I'm a somewhat regular gym goer and it's been very interesting over the past month or so to try to figure out ways to do these exercises with weight but without having actual dumbbells. So I'm just trying to tally up what I've done. Um, I pushed the washing machine and dryer apart to create space and did dips in between those um, I've been doing pull-ups on tree branches. I put a rope over a tree branch. I've used that as a TRX. Um, I've been using the propane tank from the grill as a weight. So I've been holding that for squats. I've been deadlifting it, shoulder pressing it. You know, uh, I, when I put up one of my posts on the Connecticut page, I said, you know, find a big book or a small child 
Like there's a lot of different options you have for things that can add weight. So I think obviously if you don't have a base, as the rest is saying, this is a good time to start building your base. And then if you do have a base, it's a time to kind of explore and figure out what else you can do on the strength side. <laughs> Perfect ah, timing. Now it's going too fast. All right, hold on guys. It's just really slow loading here. Okay. We might be back up here. Hold on one minute. Now I'm scared to hit my videos. <laughs> All right. Um, let's get on this one. All right, let's try this again, guys. Thank you for helping. That is really helpful. Okay. <clears throat> now it's loading, hold on. So, well, Larissa, while the, yeah. while the video tries to load, do you, can you think of any of the exercises that were in there? So at least you can tell us about them, even if yeah, the, the video doesn't come up. Gosh, I can, um, basically what it is, is um, I believe a dumbbell squat or a dumbbell deadlift. Uh, we got dumbbell presses, uh, dumbbell rows, and uh, some hamstring, I believe, uh, RDLs. Ooh, okay, so, so, and those are pretty basic exercises. You know, you don't need to be going crazy and inventing these Instagram workouts. No, that's, that's a good point, actually. Um, you're right. It's, it's not, it doesn't have to be complicated. And I, and, it, and you can kind of fall into this thing of, um, because there's so much social media and there's a lot of information on the internet and you can go down the rabbit hole and you can see um, a thousand and one different exercises that seem so complicated. And um, I just wanna encourage you that it's not really that hard, it's very simple. And, and the best thing you can do is um, stick with the basics and then also um, be consistent with them. You don't need to be super creative, you know, doing things standing on your head for it to, to be a good workout, okay? Um, so really it's, it's just keep it simple, the best that you can. <clears throat> yeah, right. I, I think a lot of times we forget that people have been doing these exercises for a long time and the movements for a long time before that. You know, I know you have small children. I'm yeah. sure when you watch them bend down, like they're doing things in a functional way. They're not, you're, it's not something that we need to be taught until exactly. we screw it up. Right. We do actually screw it up. Yes. We, um, I was just watching my daughter squatting on the ground the other day. Perfect. Perfect. So as we, we begin to walk, that's when all those imbalances come in. So really you just, you just want to, um, keep it simple. Um, start with the foundation and then build on that. Um, and you don't need to be doing wild and crazy exercises to get any kind of, um, any kind of benefit from them. Okay, I'm gonna just try to move on from this so we don't uh, run into this problem. My videos hate me, so. <clears throat> and as you said before, if you go to YouTube and put in dumbbell circuit, you're gonna get 100,000 options of right. Um, I, have, I, have you do. Some really, I have some really great um, resources that I'll speak about on the end, uh, at the end, um, where you guys can kind of go for uh, body weight 
anything kind of workouts that I, I think are very good and are very simple to follow. So while you're at home or even when you're at the gym, you can use them. Okay. So um, I'm just going to move on here to the barbell one. I'm kind of scared to hit this video, so I might just talk it out to you guys. But basically, um, once you're comfortable with the dumbbells and um, by no means do you actually have to pick up a barbell, okay? You can actually get a lot done with dumbbells and you can uh, get a lot of great work out of it, like I said, by changing the load, changing the tempo. Um, you know, you can even use dumbbell workouts to get some conditioning in um, as well. And I'll kind of touch on that later as well. But Point being is if you're looking for some some other progression from the barbell um, from the dumbbells, then you want to get into maybe looking at some barbell workouts. So that's um, grabbing the, the barbell, uh, barbell squat, um, barbell split squats, uh, barbell rows, uh, bench presses, barbell RDLs. And the reason why this is great progression is because naturally when you're progressing, you need to load more and you can load a lot on a barbell. So if you're trying to hit like a, a max strength um, phase, uh, the best way to kind of do that is through um, using the barbells because you can put the most weight on them. Um, and how do we progress them? We add more weight. We change the load just like anything else. We change the progression. And also we get into um, training the different facets of um, our muscle and how it works. So isometrically, that's exactly what you um, did with the wall sit. You're holding it. That's an isomet um, isometric wor workout. So you can do isometric things with uh, the barbells. You can do it with dumbbells as well and with body weight. Um, working eccentric, which is um, the downward phase so if you're squatting the in the eccentric phase is the down phase of the squat concentric would be coming up okay our muscles have various actions and we need to train them and um you can do progress workouts by working on these different facets um eccentric training is great when you're working about uh talking about injury prevention especially for hamstrings and it's also um really great um, for working on things like deceleration when you're um, talking about speed and coming and slowing down from speed. <clears throat> oh, it's actually playing. All right, here we go, guys. So this is the barbell workout. Hopefully it won't stall on us, but if you want to get into it, I'm not saying that you have to do, um, these are Olympic lifts. These are really great for power and speed training. Also great for getting some conditioning in as well um, with very light loads, might I add. Um, I added in the band walks again here. Some of these repeat a little bit, so I'm sorry, but... Um, <clears throat> So here's a second block. You can circuit these. This is a front squat. You can also do one as a back squat. Um, front squat and back squat, um, the load is a little different. Um, I like the front squat for uh, before you put uh, the bar on your back for a back squat because it just um, forces good form because the weight is out in front of you. This is my intern at URI, one of my interns. She's a beast. She can probably do about 20 of those. So girls can do pull-ups. You guys got to work really hard. I, I believe in you. Um, here's that barbell RDL I was talking about. You can also do these with dumbbells. Great for posterior chain, which is glutes and hamstrings. Um, really um, needed, especially for sprint sprinting. This is a dumbbell. I added this into the uh, barbell workout, but you get a little idea of this is a core exercise. So this is total body. It's not just completely all um, barbells, which is why some of these things are in here. <clears throat> I think that is the last one for barbell. Yep. All right. All right, so here is um, a good little chart that is, I think, great for you guys to kind of understand when you're going through the different phases of um, training. So you always want to start with um, an endurance or a hypertrophy phase, okay? It's kind of like in conditioning, you want to start with endurance also because you need to build a base, 
All right, so you can't just jump in and do maximum strength and think that you're going to, um, you know, progress really well without building the foundation. Okay, endurance in the hypertrophy phase in a workout is going to help to grow the muscle and it's going to um, set up the potential for the strength and power. Okay, so here are some of the um, set the loads and the sets and the reps that work for this. I think this is a great little chart and um, it also gives you the tempo. So when you guys are in the gym or you're trying to plan out what you're going to do over the seasons, um, it gives you a good idea of what you should be um, aiming for. So endurance is always going to be 60 to 75 percent of your rep max and that is your one rep max. So or it could be a three rep max too but Basically, at some point, you want to be able to get um, a maximum um, rep or a maximum load that you can lift so that you can use it for um, properly periodizing your training. Um, you don't have to do one rep max. You can do a three rep max, and they have these wonderful calculators that you can download right to your phone um, to calculate those things so you're not doing a like a shot in the dark. Um, there is one in particular that I have on mine. It's called One Rep Max. And say um, you don't want to go to complete one rep, which is fine. I understand that um, a lot of people are concerned with injury when it comes to that. And like I said, you definitely don't want to just jump into run one rep maxes ever. Um, you can um, put in, say, you know, you had a hundred pounds that you squatted for five reps. You can put that in and it will give you your estimated one rep max. That's fine and that's great to kind of go off of these loads. So um, <clears throat> it, this is a great chart that you can follow. It gives you the reps, the sets, um, the how much rest you should be taking in between each um, exercise and then what the tempo should be. <clears throat> um, I put up another uh, chart here too. It just gives a good look at phases um, in what phase it should, how it should kind of flow um, the strength training phases when you're looking at your calendar and you're trying to plan out your seasons, your year. And I'll get a little bit more into that as I um, periodization comes around. But basically you always want to start off with the hypertrophy hypertrophy or that um, endurance phase. That's always going to be um, high reps high sets, short rests in between. Okay, so you get a little cardiovascular um, um, benefit from it too. And the loads are gonna be low and the volume is gonna be high to moderate, okay? So you're gonna be doing a lot of work, but the load isn't gonna be high. And that's, that's just to help with some muscle growth. And then the next is phase two. You want to move into strength and power. It's going to be moderate to low reps. Sets are moderate. Rest is moderate. Load is moderate. And the volume is moderate. Okay. And as you get into that power um, phase, that's usually just before your peak phase. So think of your peak phase as right before your season or you're peaking for your season. So if your um, fall season is going to be the busiest and the most um, – active and you're trying to be in the best shape to withstand the rigors of that season, that is where your peak is going to be. So that's where you want to kind of peak that like couple weeks or that week before your actual season. So this would be say through the summer, hypertrophy, you're going to go through your strength phase to your power phase, you're going to peak, that's going to probably be that week or so right before you go into your uh, busiest time and that's when a lot of things are going to be very low and you're kind of almost going through the motions so that your body can kind of rest from all that training and be prepared to go in for your for your big season and then your your phase four would be recovery <clears throat> and this can be um this can be over a, a year span and this could be over um, a month's training span okay so it just depends on what your goal is but this is kind of how the phases flow um, at the very basic level for when you're making your own training all right so public service announcement <laughs> 
It is easy, it is very easy to go through the motions, okay? I've watched this a thousand times. You can go in there and pick up the dumbbells and you can move them and you can do the exercises and you can get absolutely nothing out of it. You have to put into it what you want to get out of it, okay? So you actually have to do the work and it has to be hard and it should be hard. And you will not progress or make any gains if you don't, if you don't stress the body enough, okay? So... Strength and growth only comes through continuous effort and growth. So you have to put in the work to actually make the gains. And, and the stimulus has to be enough. So basically no dilly-dallying at the gym and you need to uh, feel some discomfort in order to make, um, make some changes. <clears throat> All right, so now we're going to get through the to the conditioning piece here. I feel like I'm like going really slow. Sorry about that. Um, slow videos. <clears throat> We're going to get into conditioning. And this is a really big piece for you guys. We talked about strength. That's the foundation. The strength is a piece is going to um, help us to build strength. It's going to help us to build power. It's going to set, set the stage for speed. And it's going to um, help us to ward off injuries. And next, conditioning. Okay, you need it because you're running on the field and you need to keep up with the play. Um, let me just say this conditioning, just like any sort of training should not be a shot in the dark. So some of you uh, are going to go out and, you know, you're like, I need to condition and you just hit the road and you go for like five mile run and you think that's good. And you're like, all right, I'm good. Uh, that felt good. I'm sweating. It's kind of not really useful. It has to be purposeful and, um, the way I think that you can be on purpose with your conditioning and make it more specific is to invest in a heart rate monitor. And the reality is, I think that um, Kara had talked to me about this, that at that level, I know at the women's national level and the men's, they all wear heart rate monitors at this point. The science has brought us far enough where we can um, monitor in-game heart rates, what's happening, like in recovery between sprints, everything. And um, this way they can base their training off of very real time, individual information for each um, player. And uh, Kara had told me that they actually, uh, that's part of when you get into FIFA or a high level refing, um, they give you heart rate monitors. And I think that's great. So that's something that I think that if you guys are serious about getting to the next level that you need to invest in some sort of heart rate monitor system. And um, so that you're not just training to train with no, um, actual information to help you to figure out what it is that you're actually doing when you're running in conditioning. So uh, my favorite is the polar heart rate monitor. Um, I, I have the most experience with this and it is what they use at the national level for um, uh, men's and women's soccer, I believe. And um, a lot of the collegiate um, programs who have the money for these things because they're really expensive. Not in for you guys, not so much, but um, the big, you know, team polar heart rate monitors are, are huge um, costs. But these, I think the, the strap here, um, you could get probably on Amazon, I think probably like 15 bucks or so um, is this little um, strap that you see and it's a Bluetooth. So it goes right to your phone. You can see that the little um, iPhone emblems there um, and it will track your heart rate, your training, your training loads. And uh, the app is called Polar Flow. There are several other ones, MyZone, I think Garmin has one. I um, particularly like the Polar one because of the kind of information it gives you, including um, recovery, which is, is really important. So that said, here is the um, chart, the polar heart rate chart. And if you hook yourself up to the heart rate monitors, this is what you're gonna, um, this is what you'll find. They have this, the different zones, okay? Um, one through five, one being very light, five is hard. This way, when you're training, you know exactly what zone that you're in. And if you're trying to achieve a specific training um, outcome, then you know where to go, okay? So 
this, I'm just going to read these one, these off because they're, they're really great explanations. Okay. So maximum is 90 between 90 and hundred percent of your heart rate max. Um, that means that the train you're going to be in that for that less than five minutes, it benefits maximal or near maximal effort for breathing muscle. It feels very exhausting and it's recommended for experienced and fit athletes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you are not trained, you're going to get up into this level very quickly on a run or a sprint. So <clears throat> if it takes you a very, very short time to get to maximum or even hard, you might have to start looking at what your training level is. Okay. Um, it's going to be very low. Um, somebody who is highly trained is going to be, it's going to take a lot for them to get to maximal effort or the hard area. And um, somebody who is untrained, it's going to be much quicker. Okay. So then the heart is that 90, 80 to 90 percent of your um, heart rate max. Um, this one is good for um, high speed and sustaining high speeds and endurance. Okay. So this is going to be uh, high intensity training. Uh, it might even be um, some tempo running endurance, and we'll get into that. And then next is 70, 80 percent. Uh, this is moderate intensity. This is um, the lower end of this is kind of getting into in, endurance, and I'll and I'll go over that a little bit more in the next slide. Two is light. This is like recovery. Um, this is kind of where your heart rate should be, maybe if you're doing active recovery or you're going for a recovery run. And then very light is basically recovery. <laughs> if you're ever in 50 for 60 percent while you're doing sprints, then you're definitely not running fast enough <laughs> or hard enough, I should say. All right, so conditioning methods. How do we condition? There are several uh, modalities. There are several ways that you can do this. Medicine balls, circuit training with dumbbells, like I spoke about before. You can get some cardiovascular out of that. Um, ropes, you've probably seen some ropes before. Um, push, pull, carry. That means basically um, that is uh, pushing a sled, pulling a sled, carrying heavy weights, sprinting, running, and swimming, especially for injury. Uh, for you guys, I, um, I would just recommend the best thing for you guys to do is to be running on a grass uh, field or some grass. Um, the road is fine if you don't have anything else, but here's the thing if you're doing a lot of running and you run into a lot of injury problems with knees and, and such, running on a hard road is, is not gonna help that, okay? So the best thing that you could do is, is do your running on the grass. You, you essentially, your job is on the grass, you need to do it on the grass. Some of these other modalities are gonna be really great for um, supplementing with your conditioning, um, using it maybe in an off season, and also um, if you're injured, uh, other ways that you can get conditioning in without having to run if you have knee injury or some kind of lower body injury. And swimming, really great for injury. Okay, so how the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the base, aerobic capacity. How do we build it? Um, it's not just long, painful runs for miles and miles, okay? Not a shot in the dark. It's 60 to 70 percent of your heart rate max. It's um, that's if you want to just basic aerobic capacity. It also can mean tempo and threshold training, which is about 70, 80% of your max heart rate. And then also can include things such as aer aerobic intervals, which is less than 85% of your heart rate max. So these are the training zones you want to be when you're um, trying to achieve aerobic capacity. And um, like I said, it doesn't just have to be long, painful runs. You can get creative with it. You can do tempo. You can do aerobic intervals. The um, aerobics is the foundation, and you can actually get aerobic benefit from doing sprints and other, other things that we'll talk about, but you cannot just do sprints. Um, you cannot just do aerobic exercise and then expect your sprinting or your speed to increase. Okay, so it does it works. It doesn't work both ways. Sprinting and uh, high interval training can help with aerobic capacity, 
but aerobic capacity will not help you to be faster as far as sprinting goes. <clears throat> so here are some examples for endurance workouts. And I'd encourage you guys to look at, um, there are a few really good resources as I did my research on you guys uh, as referees and what you do. Um, one of them is the Professional Soccer Referee Association. They have, this is where I pulled some of these workouts. Um, they have an extensive list, extensive list of, of workouts um, that are all very, very good. I've used them before myself. I've used them for some of these things for my athletes as well. And um, I, I wanted to just kind of extrapolate some of these um, for you guys to get an idea of kind of what what it looks like and what you should be doing. And I don't want to overcomplicate it, okay? Because like I said, the, the biggest thing is just consistency. And if you stick to one, two, or three workouts and just progress them over and a period of time, that's going to be much better than kind of just being all over the place. Okay, so these are some of the ones that I've um, extrapolated for endurance workout. Um, one would be 15, 20 minutes of an aerobic endurance running, 70, 80% of your heart rate max. Okay, that's in that endurance range. That's that hard, that number four hard on the heart rate <clears throat> monitor. Uh, workout two is 30, 40 minutes of aerobic endurance and running at 70 to 85% of your heart rate max. And then at the, F, at, at the end of every five minutes, perform a one minute tempo run. Okay. So like I said, doesn't have to be just straight running for miles. It can include doing some tempo runs in that, in that long run. And workout three, three minute tempo run, 80 minute to 85 minute heart rate max and one minute recovery. And then you would just continue three minutes, six minutes, nine minutes, three minutes, nine minutes, um, all at 80, 85% with that one minute recovery and it's all continuous. So it's continuous, but then you have some tempo training within that continuous running. It also breaks it up a little bit, not as boring. Okay, so we've built the foundation with endurance. So how then, we've got our endurance down, we built our foundation, we're working on our um, endurance running, how do we improve our speed? So these are some ways that you can improve your speed. Um, number one is running mechanics. It sounds so silly, but uh, you have to have correct form. I mean, we've all seen the, the sprinters or the runners with their arms and legs flailing everywhere, right? And and so soccer players are not really the best at this. They're used to like warding off defenders. Some of them, their arms are way out here while they're running. And maybe you notice you do that too, or you're not relaxed, or you have all this funky stuff going on with your limbs as you're running. <laughs> so you wanna work on the running mechanics. That's keeping your arms in tight, you know, uh, swinging them cheek to cheek, so butt cheek to, to cheek up here. Um, and if you work on that, it's going to improve your running economy. All right. And then therefore you're not um, leaking energy everywhere else. So the better form you have, the faster you're going to be purely because you're, the economy is improving. Okay. You want to build hamstring strength, really important for speed. Um, you want to do some heavy sled, sled drags. If you don't have a sled, you can do hill sprints. Hill sprints are really great to help improve speed. Um, it's also really great to keep um, some leg strength if you don't have dumbbells um, involved. So if you have a hill by your house, go ahead and run them. <laughs> um, you want to improve your stride length. Okay, your strides you can do that by um, working, doing some striders or acceleration workouts, which I'll give an example of, and then overall improve your leg strength, okay? Speed, a little bit of it has to do with genetics, okay? Some people are only gonna be so fast, but you can improve if you do these little things such as running mechanics, okay? All right, so here are some speed workouts. One. Um, to start with, before you start into the workout, you want to get into some accelerations. That's going to help. Um, the accelerations, um, not um, you're building up to 90% of a, a sprint max, or that could even be 100% of a sprint, sprint max. But it's going to be a rolling start. So it's something that you kind of roll into. You're not going from a, a standstill start. And this will actually help you to um, accelerations. You want to um, 
think about your stride length. You want to think about what your arms are doing. So it kind of warms you up. And then it also helps you to think about what's happening with your body as you're running. And then your, the, the actual workout would be sprinting at 90% of a sprint max. It's a little less than all out sprint. You want to do four sets of three of these at uh, 50 meters from a static start position. And you want to uh, focus on making the first few steps powerful, okay? That, you know, propel, propel you out. That first few um, quick, uh, first step quickness, okay? And the rest would be 30 seconds in between reps, two, min two minutes between sets. And uh, this kind of goes for everything when you're conditioning. It, when you're um, having recovery, you want to come back to about 65% uh, of your heart rate, heart rate max. Um, and that, unless of course you are trying to get less time in between for your recovery, but for this particular one, 65% um, is about recovery. Okay, that's in that three or four um, range of our heart rate chart. <clears throat> so here's just a few, this is another one, acceleration. Uh, four times 50 meters, build up to 90% of a rolling start, um, eight, the last one was, I think, 50 meters. This one's eight time 100 meters. That's 75% of a ma uh, sprint max, one minute recovery, 60 sec seconds in between um, reps. This is only just a few, okay? And I realize, you know, eight times 100 meters, some of you are like dying just thinking about that. Um, but this can be something that you, it's progressive, that you work up to that 100 meters. You, you can play around with the numbers. Um, for sure. These are just examples because there is a thousand and one of them that you could do. <clears throat> okay, so moving on to sprint workouts here. Some I really liked these. Again, I pulled these from uh, the Professional Soccer Referee Soccer Association. You look it up. It's They have really great workouts and there's some other too. I think Kara had sent me some UEFA. Uh, they have a whole PDF of these great and they were, they were all good. So I would encourage you to look at these uh, sprint workouts. So you just line yourself up on a field. If you don't have a field, just pace it out. The red, you're gonna do hard sprint, 90 seconds. Green would be an easy jog. Blue, walk recovery, and you would complete four sec, uh, sets of all four sprints, two minute active recovery. Active recovery does not mean stopping, it means jogging in between so you're not actually stopping and resting you are jogging for your rest and you're going to start at the two uh point start position um here's another sprint workout <clears throat> these are um i added this one in because i really liked um the different it, it's a speed sprint workout, but it also involved a little bit of um, agility. It had a deceleration in there and some backwards jogging, which you guys do a lot of. Um, and it added in some shuffles. So, you know, it's not refing, just like soccer is not linear. Okay. I realize you guys are a little more linear when it comes to, you're not maybe cutting as much as a soccer player, but you need to work on all facets. Um, to help prevent injury and so and you need to be able to decelerate and backwards jog and all that so i chose um this one because i thought it was great it kind of included all of those elements so you wanted to perform each sprint at 90 percent of uh, your sprint max speed backwards jogging and side shuffles and i'll just kind of let you look at that i don't really need to like go through the whole thing but um, i believe this will be up too so you guys can um take a look at it if you want. And of course, I'm always here if you need some other referencing. So here are some high intensity running workouts. And I put these in because these are all requirements um, <clears throat> for you as referees, um, what you need and, and um, what they test you on. Okay, so high intensity running workout around the field. Uh, this one easy, just around the field, two sets, six fret or laps, four minutes recovery in between. The green is 50% run, yellow 70, red 90, and then blue 60%. And another high intensity running workout. Very similar. <clears throat> This one, these, these also can be done on a treadmill. These ones that I'm showing you, not around the field, obviously. Um, 
although I wouldn't highly suggest doing treadmill unless you're caught in a situation like now, <laughs> quarantine, and or um, you do not have, you know, it's a bad day out, it's snowing, always do your best to get outside on a, on a grass field or something that's going to be a little more forgiving on the joints when it comes to injury prevention. Threw in a little agility here. Um, these are some agility workouts that you can do. Um, obviously, you, you guys need agility too, like I said. Um, maybe not as much cutting as a soccer player would do, but still, um, you need to work on all facets of strength and conditioning in order to be um, perform your best and to keep healthy. So these are great too um, because they're they're agility, but they're, you're also gonna um, get some conditioning out of them too. And um, the only thing that I would do um, after doing some of these agility workouts is if you're using it on a day that you're um, conditioning, then I would uh, stick to something more, do your agility workout and then maybe do like 20 minutes of a workout at that like moderate aerobic uh, capacity pace. Um, so you're kind of filling in the gap because this won't take very long to do. Okay, so moving on now that we've got the conditioning done um, to mob mobility and flexibility. This is gonna, this is um, important, uh, especially for recovery, but um, it's important for your joint health, keep your joints mobile, keep your joint, your muscles pliable. Uh, this is what you wanna do before and after your workouts. Um, you saw in the video, um, some of the warm ups that we did. Um, those were um, dynamic in nature and they were uh, mobile, mobility uh, workouts or exercises. So you wanna do them before and after workouts, uh, before and after games, in between games, while watching Netflix, no bad time to work on flexibility or mobility ever. Um, especially if you're doing a lot of strength training, okay, naturally our muscles, once they get tight and they're kind of adapting to that, are, are gonna lose a little bit of flexibility and mobility. So it's best to keep up on this um, for everything uh, in strength training for recovery. So flexibility, what, what types of flexibility we have? We have dynamic. Um, dynamic should be done uh, pre-workout um, and between games, okay? You don't want a static stretch before a game. Doesn't make sense. The point of a uh, flexibility or a good warm-up is to increase your heart rate, to get you sweating, and to bring blood flow to the muscles. Static stretching does not do that. It's something that you can do after your dynamic warm-up, and if you feel like you need some extra stretching, please do that. Don't static stretch, and that's all you do, and then walk out on the field and try to ref a game. Not gonna be pleasant, okay? Um, especially if you deal with a lot of um, injury type stuff. You need to be warmed up. You should be sweating before your game, and you should, um, you should be um, up into those upper echelons of heart rate that you might achieve in a game so that the first time you're, you're hitting the max heart rate is not when you're on the field already reffing a game, okay? So <clears throat> dynamic warm-up is gonna be um, involving stretching with movements and um, combining them with some um, running too. Static we all know what stack stretching is. That is for post-workout and post-game. Um, mobility essentially is dynamic stretching. Um, and it also can be joint-specific uh, mobility exercises. Um, you saw that squat to stretch that I did. Um, that is dynamic. You can do that as part of your dynamic warm-up, but that is also joint-specific. That's something that's going to open up those hips. If you have um, knee problems or hip problems, really great for that. <clears throat> All right, to my favorite, favorite part, because so many people neglect this. Um, recovery so important in and, and it's just as important as the work itself um if not more important honestly um you're not going to make any gains in anything if you're not recovering properly and you are not going to be your best self as a ref if you're not recovering in between games if you're not recovering at all 
Okay, so it's um, recovery is the immediate rest needed between games or bouts of exercise. It's uh, long periods of time, um, hours, days, weeks. There are multiple kinds. There's active recovery, which requires um, like light jogging or doing um, mobility stretching. Um, and there's passive recovery, which is just sitting around and doing nothing, which there are times for that. Um, but most of the recovery that you guys are probably going to be doing besides off, off season or maybe in a crazy, crazy season would be active recovery. That's going to be most beneficial for you to move out um, all that cellular waste from the exercise that you're doing or from the long weekend that you had um, refing tournaments. <clears throat> So how do we recover? I got these really great infographics and from um, YLMN Sports Science. They're on Instagram if you want to check them out because they have these really great um, science specific things on training and recovering. And this comes from a, um, a study that was done and it just gives you the information right there and you don't have to go searching for it. Um, through a bunch of studies. They kind of do the work for you. So how do you recover? Sleep is a huge one, sleep. And I'm gonna like harp on this in a little bit um, because a lot of you don't sleep enough and it's, it's really, um, it's where our body recovers. Um, so sleep's a big one. Hydration, proper nutrition, stretching, mobility, flexibility, uh, self myofascial release. Y'all um, have probably seen a foam roll using a foam roller, that's what that is. Um, and heat ice compression. And then this is, I can't stress this one enough, pun not intended, stress management. Um, stress, stress, um, and I think I touched on this earlier, um, is part of that mental game. If you're, if you're stressed, you are going to really set yourself up for failure as far as recovery. And not only mentally, but um, just physiologically, what's going on in your body, okay? The hormones that are released when you're stressed and what it actually does to your body is it wreaks havoc on it, including um, making you more susceptible to being sick. And when you're sick, of course, you can't ref games <laughs> or you don't want to ref games when you're sick. So he, um, what do you do post game? I put this one up here because it's a, probably what most of you are probably looking for. What do we do post game? What do we do in between games? How do we recover when we have, you know, multiple games? Um, you want to make sure, first of all, that you cool down and use stretch from a game. Okay, don't just walk off the field and go sit down and have a conversation with your buddies or whatever your other refs, not a good look. You wanna take the time to cool down, stretch, uh, bring a foam roll, uh, use those modalities um, after in between games. Um, uh, nutrition, make sure you're, um, pack, uh, be intentional about your nutrition. If you know that you have a tournament and it's gonna last over a huge long period of time, um, you need to pack your lunch, you need to make it, you need to bring it with you. You have to be intentional about feeding your body and um, and you that means planning, you can't rush it out. Um, and then of course, sleep, sleep, sleep. That's a big one, we're gonna get into that here. <clears throat> Okay, so the importance of sleep. I'm harping on this a lot because it really sets the stage for everything else. Um, and, and this is one of them, likelihood of injury based on hours of sleep per night. So an athlete who sleeps on average less than eight hours per night is, has 1.7 times greater risk of being injured than those who sleep more than eight hours. And I've seen this happen. Um, people not sleeping, um, college kids, as you can imagine, out partying, having fun, you know, days before their soccer games, and I have seen it go very wrong. Not saying that you guys are partying and going out before you're wrapping your games. Perhaps you are, I'm not judging, but um, just want you to understand that sleep is so important, okay? It's important for your muscle recovery, um, it helps restore the glycogen to your muscles and repair them. It's good for mental recovery, hormonal balance, stress regulation, metabolism, illness and recovery and prevention, okay? So if you're not getting enough sleep, 
it's not going to matter. You're at, at some point, your body is going to break down and you're just going to be so stressed that you're not going to be able to, um, um, you're not going to be able to, um, withstand the rigors. <clears throat> So setting the mood for sleep, this is just a good um, uh, checklist for um, to consider before you go to bed, quiet environment, maintaining room temperature, all of this good stuff. I'm sure you guys have heard this, um, but you, I'm not gonna exhaust you reading through the whole thing, but you can, um, you can go through it on your own. And stress management, this is a huge one. Give yourself grace, learn to say no, control the controllables, meditation and mindfulness, self-care and breathe, okay? Manage your stress. It does so much to your body um, and can really hinder your performance. All right, so, oh, what time have we got here? Okay, so you're gonna, this, we're gonna go through this. Um, this is the last part here. Um, thank you for staying with me. Sorry about the, the little delay in between. <clears throat> so managing your seasons. How do you uh, prioritize and prioritize? First, establish your goals like we talked about. Uh, grab an accountability partner. Start building your good habits. Grab your calendar out. Look at your seasons. Look at your year. Look at where your games are. Plan, start planning it out. The days you're going to work out, what you're going to do, and, and then take action. <clears throat> so when should you train? So uh, it might look different on a weekly to monthly basis based on your individual schedules. And uh, Kara had given me a little heads up on what it kind of looks like for you guys. Fall, really busy season. If you're somebody who likes to say yes to a lot of games, it can be up to 10 games a week. Uh, and then in the summer, I believe she said you have uh, mostly the weekends off and then games during the week and then spring is weekend games and mostly the weekends off. So you want to just look at the year in view, be prepared for your busiest seasons or, and your big game, and then start with your end goal and work backwards. So if your end goal is your season in the fall, you want to start there and then work backwards. So spring and summer, this um, should be prime time for uh, training, okay? I know that you're still doing some games and some of you might have some important games in this spring and slash summer phase. However, um, it's when you're gonna have the most time for training. You can train up to five days a week, okay? Six days a week, as long as you're getting a rest day. But this is exactly where you wanna hit, um, hit the training hard, three times to four times a week for strength training. And you're running kind of in between that. Um, you have to prepare then um, for your season. And that might look like, you know, 12 to 14 weeks out. Um, and it's important for building up the foundation for your season when it's really crazy and you won't be able to get as much training in. So you want to uh, build up as much strength as you can, build up your endurance because naturally you're not going to have as much time during the season to train. So this is when you want to do the bulk of your training. All right, the fall. So what do you all you can do in this time is do what you can do to maintain. Um, studies show that even strength training once, at least once a week, is better than doing nothing and help will help maintain. So you need to look at your schedule, where your games are, and schedule that one or two times you can get your strength training in, and then recovery, 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 active recovery. Um, new, be extra good with your nutrition. Uh, take care of any nagging injuries that you have. Okay, it's really really about trying to survive and then maintain. Um, I, this is not where you're going to get the bulk of your training. And this is not where you're going to try to get the best strength gains or be the fast, like get your fastest times. Okay. That's for the spring and the fall. <clears throat> and um, the winter, the winter, um, which I believe you guys, uh, some of you, if you're the college season can go to that first or second week of December. So we'll start about there for your winter. Um, this is this is really where your recovery and rest time should be. And I know Kara uh, 
talk to me a little bit about how a lot of you try to get, or some of you might try to get in the bulk of your training in the winter because you have games going on in spring and summer, but the winter is really your time for rest, your time for active recovery. So that is that uh, December to, I'd say like February-ish um, time. And that doesn't mean just sitting on your butt and doing nothing. It, that might be for a time, but um, it's active recovery time. It's, uh, it's for more alternating type of conditioning. It's for cross training. That's where you can go like play some soccer, play some basketball to keep up with your training. And um, this is where you might want to start and work on just movement and form in your strength training and then any and rehab from any injury that you might have and basically this is where you want to start to get back to the basics and um, where you want to rest mostly oops ah sorry guys i went i went um too far there all right, so preparing for your fitness test, you want to start with the end and work backwards. You want to start preparing at least 12 weeks out from your training, and you want to test yourself at least every week, minimum two weeks, okay? Use your resources. Um, there is such great training um, advice in these Professional Soccer Ref Association, the UEFA, um, on um, how how you can kind of build up that 12 to 14 weeks out if you're doing your fitness test that you're preparing to. So use your resources. And okay, working around circumstances. So when you're committed to something, you accept no excuses, only results. So this is perfect for prime time, quarantine workouts. What do we do? Uh, you're trying, you, maybe you've worked up to this point and you're like, I've gotten so far in my training and now we're stuck inside. Or how do I start? Cause I'm, you know, I am gaining 10 pounds. What do I do? Um, first suggestion is don't eat as much. <laughs> second, put the snacks away. Um, second is get outside. We're in quarantine, guys, but get outside. You can run outside. You can find a field. You can run on a bike path. Do your body weight exercises like we talked about, dumbbell exercises if you have them. And then plan workouts with your on Zoom with your pals. Find an accountability partner. Um, you need to keep the routine. If you are going to the gym every morning at 6 a.m., then you need to get out of your bed every morning at 6 a.m. while at your home and do a workout. So how do you intensify them? We talked about this a little earlier. You increase the reps, you increase the sets, you tempo train, go to failure, do supersets, do less rest time. If uh, you won't maintain your gains, if you don't increase the growth without taxing your muscles appropriately. So these are just some ways you can intensify it while you're at home with body weight. This is just a video and I'm not gonna play it because we're running short on time, but on how you can use your child as part of your, <laughs> your workout. Strap them on your back and do some dumbbell deadlifts and some squats. Oh, I guess I played. <laughs> Okay, so here are some resources that you can use for your at-home workouts. Here are some really good apps. Uh, Nike Training Club has a great one, and I believe Kara put this up on your Facebook page, but um, they have um, they have free. I think they they have free um, training on their app anyway, and things that you can pay for. But right now, because of quarantine, you can you have access pretty much to everything that they have on there. I use that. I think it's great. Uh, they have variant, you can choose by muscle type, by workout, you can choose the hit one, you can interval training, whatever. You have a lot of different resources. TRX is a good one, Peloton, Garmin. Um, there are some people on social media that I would suggest that are really great. Um, Body by Biggie or at Body by Biggie. Uh, she is somebody that I went to grad school with. She lives in Vancouver. Great at home workouts. She has um, a YouTube channel, Body by Biggie, as well. Great at home workouts for body weight, um, um, dumbbells, everything. So uh, check her out. She's really great. Mike Boyle, um, he does live workouts on his page, uh, Body by Boyle, and then Amp Fitness, which is a, a local uh, fitness training place. Um, I, I know this guy really well, Andy, and his. Um, 
his tag is Amperfit RE and one of his Amper Amp Fit RI and then one of his coaches is Coach Can Rep. All right, so I just want to touch really quickly on this um, training and injury. Like we're talking about quarantine is a speckle, special circumstance, but also it, training with injury. So unless you're bed ridden, you can basically do anything. Uh, you, you can do something, sorry, you can't do anything, but you can do something, including pool workouts, use other modalities like ropes, um, med balls, bikes, anything. Just don't sit while you're injured. Um, utilize these things. And then um, the last one is travel. So when you're traveling, I would suggest getting um, like a recovery bag with stuff like bands, um, a foam roll, find a local gym, keep your habits when you're on the road, nutrition, recovery, stretching, and listen to your body, okay? Because travel can be very hard on your body. And some days it calls for complete rest because traveling and uh, flying on airplanes can really throw... Um, a wrench into recovery. So ending with here, I know it's gone a little long, sorry guys. You can't get much done in life if you only work on the days when you feel good. So I would encourage you to just get up and do. Um, you have to start, you just gotta get off your butt and do it. You gotta, you gotta do it even if you don't feel motivated to do it because you've written down your goals and you're trying to achieve them. And then uh, the difference between impossible and the possible lies in the person's determination. So basically, how um, determined are you to get to your goals and reach them? All right, guys, I am long-winded, but here is my contact information. Hopefully, we can get a few questions in here. Sorry for the delay. Um, I kind of probably ate up a little bit of your questions time, but if you want to get any contact information from me um, or get in contact with me, that's my email and um, feel free to call or text me too. Kara or Kevin. Thank you very, 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 very much, Larissa. What we're going to do is kind of switch things a little bit and um, we're actually going to have the question session after Kahoot. Um, so we asked that folks hang out for a bit, um, but no, thank you immensely. This has been a lot of really good information that we don't normally get. So um, thanks again. All right now we're going to go with uh, Tom. Uh, Tom, go right ahead. Thank you very much, Kevin. Before we get started, I'm going to put on my exercise knowledge and <laughs> hopefully that'll help everybody out as we play Kahoot. If you have not played Kahoot before, it is a simple quiz game. I'm gonna share my screen so you can get the information about it. And what happens, I'm gonna pull up So 10 questions, questions on your screen, please answer on your second screen. Here we go, question one, in aerobic capacity training, what percentage of heart rate max is best for tempo or threshold training? 
60 to 70 percent, 70 to 80 percent, 80 to 90 percent, or slow. And once again, it's not what you prefer to do, it's what is actually best. Majority has it, 70 to 80 percent is where you want to be for tempo threshold training. Ronnie Tamburo in the lead, but only one question so far. Here's the second one. The throw-in is covered under which law in the laws of the game? 17, 14, 15, or 16? of the book, but 15 is the throw in. Will moves into the top spot. Question three. What is often the limiting factor in a training program? Having short legs, not only little friends bones, the dual or inability to turn off or nutrition. One person who is not an ambi turner on the call as well. Will still in the lead, Angela moving into second place. Which country hosted the 2015 Women's World Cup? China, China, Neighbors to the north. Nicole is the new leader, and Andres is into second place. Question five What piece of exercise equipment could also be considered descent? TRX, yoga mat, dumbbell, or jump rope? Correct answer. I'm sure someone could say yoga mat to you in a public and provocative manner. That would be considered dissent as well. Andres sneaks in to the top spot, tied with Mark Barrill at the halfway point. During kicks from the mark, what does the referee crew not do? <laughs> need to get the order of the kickers. Mark into the top spot. Nicole battling back into second. Question seven. Who is the referee for MLS Cup 2019? <laughs> Chapman, Alan Kelly, who will feature on U.S. Officials webinar tomorrow, refereed in 2018. Ryan Block, into the top spot, and he actually has a big lead, so see if anybody can knock him off. What kind of stretching should be done before games? <laughs>
direct dynamic stretching. Larissa, you taught them well. Everybody got that one. Brian Block, stretching his lead, pun intended there. What is a consideration used when judging a challenge with an arm? Start the elbow lids. Player has the next arm. Are you happy that player got the lids? Or the the weapon. Tool versus weapon is one of the big things we talk about. Pro Referees actually put a post on, up on this, I believe it was late last week, so if you go to ProReferees.com, you can read all about it. Still Ryan Block leading the pack. And our final question references back to last week. What country is the referee competing as they work with at the 2019 World Cup? Australia, New Zealand, or Iceland? Australia. Get a look at our podium. This way, Mark Will, representing Connecticut. Will, and down the top. Ryan Block, all the correct. Congratulations to Ryan the Cole and Nick. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, now we're going to get Larissa again, see if we can get some questions along with Kara. Um, uh, by the way, in your next life, you should be a, a game show host. You do that very well. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you for sticking this out. We know we ran a little bit long tonight, but um, we also understand that probably some of you have uh, some really good questions. So we want to make sure that we leave time for that. If you got to go, we understand. We won't take it personally. Uh, and we just want to thank you guys for coming. All right, so if you guys are still, for those of you who are still here, Ryan, you want to go first with your question? Mr. Two-Time Winner. <laughs> there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, so going back to the, the polar, the heart rate, yeah. uh, what's, are there any main differences between that and something like the catapult and the player tech and something like that? Um, no, they, they generally all do the same thing. I've just personally had most experience with the polar, and I think it um, – it, I like it for its recovery piece. And I also think that it, um, it's, it's pretty simple to use. Some of the other stuff can get a little technical. Um, so it's just something that I prefer, but really you don't have to use Polar. You can use any platform that you, are, you feel is best for you or that you are more familiar with. As long as it's telling you, you know, where your heart rate zone is and, and uh, recovery, I think you can, you can explore any options that work best for you. So I just, I really loved the Polar and I, um, their app is really good. Um, and it's relatively affordable as far as like, if you're <laughs> a say, one person just trying to do your heart rate, not necessarily in a team environment, <laughs> the team one, it costs a, a lot, but it's, it's relatively cheap to grab the strap and uh, the app is free. So you can, um, easily download that. So I would just recommend that for like ease of use really, but any of those platforms work fine. All right, awesome. Um, Stephanie, you're next. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so my question was, how do you deal with the athletes who come back from like major surgeries, like their mental side? So that's a really, really great question because um, I've had so many of them and uh, a lot, it's, it's a little different um, in a team setting. So if you're 
if you're asking like injury wise, like if, if you're an individual as a ref getting injured, it, it's a little different mentally handling it than a team. Um, but how I, I basically handle it with them is to involve them in team activity as much as I, I possibly can. Um, it just keeps their mental space uh, the best if they feel like they're not missing out because naturally you're already going to feel like you're missing out when you're injured. So keeping them in a good mental space is um, allowing them to do as much as they can with the team and involving them um, as much with the team as possible. Um, you become a therapist as a strength and conditioning coach. Really, um, you're the, the go, the go to. So, um, but we will also um, outsource to, um, psychologists or team psychologists who will come in and talk to teams and, and an athlete if they're getting to a place where they um, really are just mentally in a, in a, in a rut, we'll call in the professionals basically. Um, Cause really I'm only qualified to do so much in that, in that space, but all I can really do is just um, control their environment a little bit and, and just help them to stay positive and in their rehab and their in and strength training back to, um, to health, um, just setting goals and then, um, celebrating the little goals and getting to, um, each goal with excitement, no matter how little it is, because it, it helps to put them in a, in a, in a good mental state. I hope that helps. <laughs> All right, awesome. And Caleb, you have two questions. If you want to ask one, and then if we have time, you can ask the other. Sure. Um, the more important one that I want to ask for the two is, what's your opinion on the use of heart rate, heart rate variability? Mm -hmm. And if you like it, what's a device that you like to use to measure that and, how, uh, and apply it to recovery and whatnot? Yeah, so heart rate variability is great. Um, it uh, it actually gets down more to the nitty gritty of a heart rate training than just straight polar. Um, I haven't particularly, especially with my athletes, worked highly with it only because um, for us, it's just keeping it simple for them, um, especially when you're training in a group setting. So individually as you guys would be training mostly, it, it can be very beneficial. And I, and I think that um, if you wanna explore the avenue, you absolutely can. Um, I just haven't done it so much um, in the athlete setting for the reason of uh, the complexity of, of, of it. Um, when you're working with that many people and you're trying to, uh, train that many people, you have to use the technology, but not, um, complicate it either. Um, so if you're looking to get to the nitty gritty, absolutely. I think it's great. And any, anything that you would want to use to do that is, is awesome. Um, I just haven't really used it very much with my athletes for that reason. Yeah. That's a good right. question. Though. That is a good question. <laughs> All right. And Audra? Hi. Um, okay. So I think you, that you did a phenomenal job on saying the different types of workouts and kind of preseason versus postseason with recovery and focusing on strength uh, in the offseason. So I really appreciate that. But I want to take it a step further yeah. as far as during the season goes and yes. like the days leading up to a game and then the days yeah. in the game, kind of how should we structure our workouts that we're not during a game lifted, you know, two or three days ago? Yeah. How does that work? Good question. Um, so basically you want to look at, um, start off at how many, how many games you are. So say, say it's um, the weekend and you have, you know, X amount of games. What you want to do is, um, you want to do your hardest workout if you're able to get that workout in the furthest away from uh, the game that it is as possible. Um, and like I said, in season is not a place where you want to gain max strength or go crazy um, trying to be the fastest as 
far as sprinting, you should have already done all of that stuff in your off season training to prepare you for your season. So the goal of the in season is just to maintain what you have. One to two times a week is tr of training is great. Um, either the hardest workout you wanna do, the furthest away from uh, the, the bulk of your games. And this might be a little controversial, but um, say you have a game on Sunday night and you don't have another game until Friday or Wednesday, um, you can actually get a workout in after the game because then the next day is going to be recovery. So on that last day of training or that, or sorry, that last day of a lot of games, you can get in a good training session. You might be a little tired, but um, the whole idea behind it is that um, you've already taxed your body. You can get in your training session and then the next day is going to be a recovery day anyway. And um, leading up to the, to the following week of your your game schedule so it really just depends on on your your um schedule i would say um you want to probably keep the training like two days away from if you're doing strength training per se um away from like your game so if you have a game on saturday um you want to maybe do your last strength training workout on that wednesday so you have that like 24 48 hour window you typically will get the sorest from anything like 48 hours after so you have to think about that um, but you also um, like I said shouldn't be super sore in season training because you don't want to tax your body that much you're just trying to maintain we're not trying to like you know blow the doors off and be <laughs> like strength trainer of the year <laughs> during the season. I hope that helps a little bit, but it's really just looking at your game schedule and then um, managing it. And you know, and, and it, it also can be different person to person because you know your body and you know how you recover. So you might recover quick, more quickly than the next person. And if you feel like that you can handle that workout, you know, um, that 24 hours before doing something light, um, then go for it. I'm not going to discourage that at all. <laughs> All right, uh, April, you had a question. You you actually had a question on your registration form. Do you want to ask that now, or did you think that Larissa answered it okay? Oh, I, I thought she answered it pretty well. I, I'm, I'm just going to be focusing on better strength training to uh, increase my joint mobility and yes. strengthen the muscles around. I think you did a great job, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. I think I did see one question from someone when you sent that to me um, that I do want to address actually. And it had to do with like knee injuries and how do you work around knee injuries um, when you're training? And I think a lot of people have this problem. So um, one is uh, you want to look at your um, hip mobility and your like glute strength and your hamstring strength. And then you also want to make sure that you are managing your what your training is, meaning uh, modality wise. So maybe it's not wise for you if you have knee problems to constantly run. Um, yes, you need to run for the, for the test and all that, but you might want to look into some other modalities and then use that 12 to 14 weeks out to start with your like true running to kind of um, help with that knee um, injury. Um, so you're not killing your knees, but um, strength training, flexibility and mobility helps that. Okay. Sorry, I had to address that one because that's a big one. I feel like a lot of people have that issue. All right, uh, Ronnie. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Uh, so collegiate strength coach as well. Just wanted to pick your brain. Cool. Um, so you were talking about heart rate monitors. Have you yeah. ever used GPS monitoring? Um, I have not used the GPS monitoring. Um, we had it on our polar. Uh, it did have a GPS mapping thing, but it, it required so much. Um, basically, they have to come in and train you on all that on how to do it. So um, the thing was, our our women's soccer team had it, and they had to pay to have 
somebody come out and train it because I'm a strength coach and I do all that stuff, but I'm not well versed in all of the technology, like in knowing the ins and outs of it. And that requires a lot of tr um, training. So I have not actually, I've seen, I've used it. I've seen the raw data, but I've not actually gotten into um, the nitty gritty of the GPS training. And, um, and none of our teams really did basketball kind of got into it, but, um, I, I've not actually worked with the GPS. It would be really awesome to learn, but I have not. I think a lot of referees actually like using the GPS maps and stuff because we, yeah. uh, we get a kick out of the data. So. Yeah. It's more of like, for us, we, lo we would look at it. Um, but it just, reality is for some of our coaches, they just didn't care enough either <laughs> like, for us to like learn about it. They're like, yeah, okay. Like, you know, a lot of it is getting people on board with the technology too. And yeah. um, they didn't want to pay to have the training to like learn, you know, how to utilize the GPS mapping um, at its best. And uh, you know, so yeah. it's com it's having to convince people that it's worth the the data is worth it also, and a lot of them were not willing to take the time or the effort or the money to do to use that at the college level anyway, or, or yeah. at least at Rhode Island University of Rhode Island Division One. I. I mean, I'm sure at like LSU or some other big colleges, they definitely get into that. Right. All right, Andrew, you also asked a really great question um, in your registration sheet. Would you oh like to answer that or ask that? Hi, uh, I don't know the specific question that you're referencing, but yeah, if you wanted to, I don't know if you can see them or not though. Yeah, you want me to read it for you? Sure. You, you basically, you were, you, this first part of your, her, your question, I think she did a good job answering but you also asked, should all referees work with a personal trainer and what to look for in a personal trainer if you're picking one? Okay. So, I mean, if here's the thing. If you cannot uh, do it on your own and you can't do it efficiently on your own and you're trying to get to the next level, then yes, absolutely. Find somebody to work with. You need somebody to work with. Um, I think I, I read that question too, is like, do you work with a strength coach? Do you work with a personal trainer? How do you choose one? Uh, you know, one size doesn't fit all in this because there are a lot of people who are personal trainers, but not actually personal trainers. So um, you have to be careful about how you vet the process. You have to make sure they have the right, um, you know, they have the credentials for it. Um, but whether you use a personal trainer or a strength coach, I think it, it just really matters if um, they are uh, looking for your needs and what you need and understand like as a ref, what you need to do and where you need to get to. And um, hopefully that what makes a good strength coach kind of gives you some good uh, frame of reference, but you guys should really consider yourself athletes. So I would seek somebody else who out who specializes with athletes because I think they would probably give you the best training for what you need. Okay. On that note, Larissa, thank you immensely. Um, this has been really invaluable. Um, and I, I'm sure if they can clap, they would be clapping now because we don't get enough of this sort of information. And during the season is a bad time to start picking up um, stuff like this. So no, thank you immensely. And, and on behalf of um, the entire Academy, we, uh, we just want to uh, say thanks. For those of you who need um, her information, uh, I do have a slide on the, uh, montage, on the uh, ending montage um, with her contact information. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to her. Um, uh, anything else you want to say before we go, Larissa? Um, it was a pleasure being here for you guys. Um, I love this stuff. It's basically my life. It is my life. So 
feel free to contact me and reach out if you need any help. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list of training because there are so many ways and so many things and it's individualized. So please um, don't just be shooting in the dark. If you're really serious about your um, where you're going as a referee, please get some help. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be for me, but if you do um, want to get to the next level, then I'm here to help. Thanks again. We really appreciate it. So. Appreciate the claps. I see them. <laughs> Kevin, you're, you're, I think you muted yourself. <laughs> I can hear you talking in the basement. That's funny. <laughs> okay. How's that? Is that better? Much yeah. better. Oh, good. So tomorrow we have Alan Kelly, the former Irish FIFA and MLS pro referee. Uh, he's going to talk about game management. And next Wednesday, we, uh, we will be hosting national referee coach Eric Simmons, who is the Northeast Pro Regional Development Assistant. Uh, please check uh, our uh, U.S. Officials uh, Referee Facebook page for the registration link, uh, which should be coming up uh, probably today or tomorrow. On behalf of the Referee Academy, I just want to thank you for joining. Uh, please feel free to leave us feedback by the Google feedback form that we've already sent through. Uh, all constructive feedback is appreciated. Uh, once again, thanks to U.S. officials for sponsoring. Uh, enjoy our referee montage. Please be safe and healthy, and we'll see you guys tomorrow with Alan Kelly. Have a good night, everyone.